to preserve our credibility, we need to get inflation back to our normal level. And if that increases the unemployment rate by Sure. So what we were looking at is as of this week, the S&P 500, its forward price to earnings ratio is trading at 20 times, which does not happen very often. The average is usually about 16 times over uh, past decades. And we wanted to look at, for anyone who's thinking about trying to chase and buy in at these prices, uh, does it tend to stay at this level for five or 10 years? And when we look back a century of data, there's never been a case where valuations stayed above the average of 16 times for five consecutive years when your starting point was this 20 times number that we're at today. And a good example of this is at the beginning of 1998, in the middle of the dot-com bubble, we got to 20 times forward earnings in the S&P 500. And obviously we had two more years running higher in that bubble. And you felt like you were missing out if you weren't owning all those crazy tech stocks. But if you looked at the total return of the major indices like the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, or the NASDAQ composite, from the start of 1998 to the start of 2003, there was zero total return and actually even a little bit of a decline in the NASDAQ composite over those five years. And so when we compare that to the current risk-free rate where you can get a three-month treasury annual return of over 5%, we're okay being patient and really holding to our metrics of when we want to buy something and at what price, rather than feeling that we have to jump in at these prices. I want to ask you about uh, why you think valuations may be uh, an indicator of, of what you should do. I've heard that valuations are possibly one of the worst indicators of price movements. Would you agree or disagree with that statement? It's not a great indicator of price movement in the short term. So there's not a lot of correlation between starting valuation and what the market's going to do in the next 12 months. Uh, the market can go in any direction it wants to, depending on how much greed or fear investors are feeling at that time. But when you stretch out your time horizon, and we're usually looking at stock investments, looking out five years, over a five or 10 year time horizon, the starting valuation absolutely matters. And so from what we're just saying here, if you're starting at 20 times earnings and thinking that within the next five years, it's going to come back to 16 times earnings, that's a 20 to 25% decline just baked in already that you then have to overcome with earnings growth. And we're not starting at trough earnings. Right now, it seems like people are expecting anywhere from 8 to 11% earnings per share growth in 2024 and 2025. We'll see if that actually happens. But even if it does, that plus the valuation compression you're only looking at probably a three to 5% annual return in the uh, the major stock indexes over the next several years, which just doesn't seem like worth taking the risk unless you can find individual stocks trading at great valuation. How would you respond to the argument that uh, the S&P 500 has over time uh, become more and more uh, tech heavy? And so what, what we see now is perhaps an expansion of overall PE because these tech companies have higher PEs than perhaps other industries. And so if we consider that, one could make the argument that the S&P is actually fairly, if not undervalued compared to uh, just the tech sector overall. Would you would you agree or disagree with that? It, I understand the point that you know we have higher quality businesses that represent a greater concentration of the market today, and therefore they should trade at higher valuations. If we just look at the last 10 years, the average price to earnings ratio of the market is 17 times. And that really encapsulates this period where tech has become a much bigger factor. The other thing you have to remember with tech though is when tech businesses stop showing that double digit growth, especially in revenue growth, which is the big driver of tech valuations, when you see them slow down to only grow at about the same rate as the overall economy, those valuation multiples compress really quickly. And so Right now, you have the top six or seven uh, stocks in the market. Take away Alphabet because that trades at a pretty good free cash flow yield. The other big six names, Amazon, Tesla, Meta, Apple, and Microsoft, those types of names are trading at 40 times free cash flow. That's just not sustainable. And typically, everything's going to come back to 30 times or less in a free cash flow or an earnings multiple as the growth slows or competition increases. And that's going to act as a headwind for a market-based uh, indice like the S&P 500 in the years to come.
So what's more likely to happen? So you've got two sides of the PE equation. You've got price and you've got earnings. Will price move down? Will earnings uh, improve? If you were to see uh, either an expansion of PE or a, uh, or a continuation of current levels. Well, even if you get, let's say like next year, we're expecting 10% uh, earnings per share growth, at least that's what the market expects. If you just look at consensus expectations, that's still only going to reduce this 20 times forward number down to 18 or 19 if you fast forward six months or 12 months. So you're still trading at above average valuations and you don't have this earnings acceleration because you've still got monetary tightening uh, happening around the world and rates are going to stay high. One other factor to consider with the earnings per share growth, we just went through a period of the last 30 or 40 years where we've seen numbers that 40% of the growth in earnings per share was carried by tailwinds in interest expense because we had interest rates declining since 1981 and lower tax rates. Those two tailwinds are gone. So you really are just relying on nominal GDP growth. So revenue growth, and maybe they can expand their margins a little bit, but we're still at a pretty high profit margin level across different industries. So you're looking at maybe four or 5% profit growth, maybe a little bit of share buybacks. It's probably like a, a 6% earnings per share growth that you would expect in the years to come for the overall market. Okay. I do want to come back to your uh, macro outlook, but first let's talk about your sector uh, bias. And, uh, and then we'll discuss uh, the rationale behind your pick. So which sectors do you like the most right now? Right now, we like the defensive sectors. At the start of this year, the majority of positions that we own in our stock portfolios were actually in the tech and consumer discretionary area. But those have performed so well in the first seven months of this year that none of them really look that undervalued at this point. So you really want to shift and see where is the relative value. And when you look at defensive sectors, you often want to look at their relative price to earnings multiple versus the market multiple. They tend to trade in a pretty consistent range on a relative basis. And so what we're seeing is there's numerous healthcare and consumer staples and even utilities names that are trading at 10-year lows on a relative price to earnings basis. So in recent months, we've especially been purchasing health insurance businesses, which there is some concern about medical loss ratios going higher, but recent earnings reports have shown that that's not as bad as was feared. Uh, we're also looking at some of the pharmaceutical businesses that are trading at lower valuations, but still generate lots of free cash flow. And you're starting to see some of the consumer staples names pull back, although they're not quite at the level yet that we'd feel like they're an absolute value and we'd start really adding them. And, and do you think that uh, from a valuation basis, these defensive sectors are fairly valued? They're somewhat undervalued on an absolute basis. Uh, when you're thinking about defensive, when is the right time to own defensive sectors? It tends to be around this point in the cycle where the overall market multiple is near its high. And these are trading somewhat undervalued on an absolute basis, uh, but they're really trading cheaply on a relative basis. And they typically will kind of hold their ground because there's a lot of visibility and stability in their cash flows through the economic cycle. But typically, if you're trying to buy this at the absolute cheapest uh, absolute multiple that you could find, it likely means that the overall market has declined by a lot and you're better served investing in other cyclical sectors. So you're kind of playing a balancing game. But in terms of managing the whole portfolio, now is the time to really look in those defensive areas. What's the dividend yield on some of these defensive plays compared to other sectors? It depends on what you're looking at and the style of the business. So the health insurance businesses, those dividend yields are lower, maybe one or 2%. But some of the pharmaceutical companies uh, have a 4% yield or higher. Uh, and so those are areas that we might look to uh, really put those in some of our income investors' portfolios. If you're looking for a much higher yield than that, we're really setting a bar of looking for a 6% dividend yield or greater to try and eclipse that 5.4% yield in the short-term treasury. And that 6% yield or higher, you're finding in some high-quality REITs, uh, as well as some of the oil pipelines that have been performing well in recent months, but were providing us some great valuations at different times in the first half of the year. Okay. So if I were to make the overall assessment that right now uh, it's too expensive to be jumping into the markets, the overall index, if you were to just to buy the S&P 500 index, um, and it's probably better to wait for a pullback in valuations like you mentioned, 
uh, but there may be opportunities in certain sectors uh, that are undervalued. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that example I pointed out of those six of those very large tech companies trading at 40 times free cash flow, we think you can find names trading at 14 or 15 times free cash flow or even 10 times free cash flow that uh, are great entry points and might have a lot more stability uh, in terms of their cash flow generation, even if there is an economic slowdown. So those are the areas that we think we're looking at more at this time. One thing that uh, maybe just for everyone to know is this inflation number, the CPI that just got printed earlier this month of 3% year over year inflation, that might be the low number in that metric for the rest of the calendar year. And if we have numbers where they start moving higher up towards three and a half percent again out through December, that's going to make it a tough position for Fed Chairman Powell to not consider hiking rates again, because he really needs to see the CPI get down to two percent and see that core PCE number that's at four point seven percent still get down at least below three and a half or three below all the different Treasury yields before he can start to say that he's accomplished his mission of fighting inflation. What happens if a recession comes, which is to say that unemployment rises before the core PC drops down to close to 2%, do you think the Fed will still hike then? We think they're really focused on inflation. Uh, more than half of the households in the United States have less than $10,000 in savings. Higher inflation affects all of those households, all US citizens. And I think their view on it is we need to, to preserve our credibility. We need to get inflation back to our normal level and if that increases the unemployment rate by, they're saying, I think 1% in their projections, then I think they would accept that if they can get things back to a more normal level.